I have a sweet tooth, which means I like eating chocolate, cakes, biscuits, and anything sweet. So, recording a podcast about cakes and pastries is the icing on the cake for me. It's doing three really enjoyable things together. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Reza and Craig. Hello, and if you're a new listener to the podcast, you're very, very welcome. It's good to have you here. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with more than 50 years of teaching English between us, we're going to help you improve your English and take it to the next level. How are you doing, Reza? I'm doing very well. I really enjoyed that cup of coffee we had earlier with, uh, it wasn't a pastry or a cake, but it was something related to them, a very nice uh, homemade biscuit. But we've actually already done an episode on biscuits. That's why they don't appear here. We're specifically doing pastries and cakes today. Why have we decided to talk about pastries and cakes, Craig? Well, I have to apologize to friend of the show, Pilar from France, who asked us quite a while ago to create an episode speaking about cakes and pastries because Pilar is working in a pastry shop and she would like to know some vocabulary to sweeten up her English. So I'm sorry for the delay, Pilar, but here we are with an episode for you and for anybody who's interested in cakes and pastries. Did you notice, Reza, at the beginning I said I'm doing three really enjoyable things together, but I only mentioned two? Yes, I was wondering about that. What is the third? Podcasting, cakes, and hanging out with you. Oh. Three things together. That's the icing on the cake, my three favourite activities. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. And uh, as I said, we've already done an episode about biscuits, and I just had a very nice biscuit about half an hour ago with Craig. We all you had two actually. That's true. He's, he's keeping. <laughs> I'm count. not. I'm not counting. No, no, no. no honestly, no. <laughs> uh, how many did you have? Did you, uh, um, I had two as well. Uh, I had one before you came. Ah, yeah, you sneaked one in before I got here. We've also done an episode on coffee and cafe culture. By the way, don't confuse those words. It often happens. Coffee is the drink and cafe is the place where you have the drink. Uh, the biscuits one is episode 207. The coffee and cafe culture is 193. And another related one is episode 142 about cooking vocabulary and our favorite food which has some references to sweet food as well have a look in the show notes for the numbers just go to inglespodcast.com slash and write in the number of the appropriate episode 207 biscuits 193 coffee and cafe culture and 142 cooking vocabulary and our favorite food and to see the show notes and vocabulary from today's podcast, go to inglespodcast.com slash 491 for this podcast episode show notes. Cakes and pastries. What's the difference, Reza? That's a very good question. There's probably a little bit of ambiguity, but on the whole, let's say that cakes are generally soft, sweet, and moist, M-O-I-S-T, moist. Moist means slightly humid, have a little bit of liquid in them. And they're often served as desserts. Not always, but often. You can have a cake on its own without the rest of a meal. Also, cakes are often iced and decorated. Now, that doesn't mean that they have ice on them, cold ice. No, icing is that sweet stuff that you can put on top of a cake. Some examples of classic well-known cakes are chocolate cake, of course. Craig's had a couple of pieces of those in his time. Victoria sponge, one of my favorites, carrot cake. And my mum makes a very good Victoria sponge, which is a classic British or Irish dessert or cake. 
It has sponge, obviously, el bizcocho, yeah, in Spanish, the sponge. How would you describe sponge for someone who doesn't speak Spanish? Because you can use a sponge in the bath or the shower, or when you're washing the dishes, you use a sponge to clean the dishes. Exactly, and I think that's where the, the name comes from. So a natural sponge is something, actually, you can, you can find in the sea. It's a, a material which has lots of holes in it. It holds a lot of water. So people use sponges in the bath or the shower to wash themselves. So it's um, something which will will hold a lot of water. So that's perfect for, for cleaning yourself. So sponge cake is then a substance which is similar in the sense that it has like little tiny holes going through it. So the air gets through it. And it's also moist, that word I said earlier. There's a certain amount of humidity in sponge. So Victoria sponge, that's the sponge. And in the middle, it's kind of like a sandwich. In the middle, it will have cream and something similar to jam, strawberry jam or something like that. And on the top, more cream. Some people put icing, but traditionally it should be cream with perhaps strawberries on top. That's a favourite of mine. Do you like Victoria sponge? I don't mind it. It's not my favourite cake. My sister makes a very good Victoria sponge. And yeah, I quite like it. But again, if I had to choose, I'd go with a chocolate cake. Now, cake, be careful because it can be a countable noun and it can be uncountable. If you're speaking about the whole cake, all of the cake, then you can count it. One cake, two cakes, many little cakes. But generally speaking, if you're cutting the cake, you'd ask for a piece of cake or a slice of cake. So in that use, it's uncountable. A bit like the word chocolate, yeah? You can buy a box or bag of chocolates, which contains, let's say, 25 chocolates. But Craig, on the whole, he just likes chocolate, <laughs> the uncountable. Whether it's sweets or whether it's bits, any type of chocolate. Or bars. Or bars or liquid, drinking chocolate, he doesn't really mind. So cake is something similar. It has a countable meaning and it has an uncountable meaning. So Rez has described cakes uh, or the cake very well. Let's look at the word pastry. Now, pastries can be sweet and they can be savory. If something's savory, it has a more salty taste. So not sugar, but salt, sweet and savory. And it often has a, a flaky and layered texture. So a flake, maybe you've eaten corn flakes, or maybe you've been in a country where it's snowing and you've seen snow flakes. So a flake is a piece of something, but if something is flaky, the adjective, then it easily breaks or separates into flakes. And if something is layered, then it's kind of a sheet on a surface. For example, you can speak about furniture having two layers of paint, or you can speak about your desk, or in this case, my desk, having a thick layer of dust. So if it's layered, it's one sheet on top of another. So flaky and layered texture. And examples of pastries, we could call a croissant a pastry, a Danish pastry, and puff pastries. And we'll look at those more a bit later. Also, the word pastry, like cake, has an uncountable meaning. So as well as talking about a specific pastry, like a Danish or a croissant, the material pastry is what the pastry is made of. So it's a bit confusing, isn't it? So in Spanish, I would say the uncountable word pastry would be either la masa, or it could also be hojaldre. Yeah, so it can be uncountable. The material you, you use for making pastries is pastry, or you can count two, three, four, five different pastries. But the basic difference between a cake and a pastry are in the ingredients, the texture, and the preparation methods that are used. So let's start with our list of cakes and pastries. Cupcake is the first one on our list. A cupcake is a small individual cake which often has decorative icing or frosting on top. So icing, frosting that decorate 
the top of the small cake. Yes, I just want to point out a little regional thing. I never use the word cupcake myself, although I'm very familiar with it. In Ireland, we always refer to cupcakes as buns, B-U-N-S. But that's confusing because bun has another meaning. It's the bread, which is not sweet at all, that you use for a hamburger, a burger bun. But in Ireland, when you say bun, you're talking about a cupcake. So it's a, it's a little regional variation. Don't be surprised, Spanish speakers, if I were to ask you, what's a tortilla? I guess if you're Spanish, you're going to say it's something made of eggs. But I guess if you're Mexican, you're going to say it's something made of corn. So don't be surprised. I use the word bun in Ireland, but the generic real, the real word that most people use is cupcake. <laughs> So what's the difference, Reza, between icing and frosting? So for me, frosting is thicker. It's denser. It's also creamier. It has more cream. And it's used for coating. So you all know what a coat is, yeah? Clothes that you can put on when you're cold. But it can also be a verb. To coat something is to cover it, like what the coat does with your body. So frosting is used for coating and decorating cakes. Whereas icing is thinner, it's, it's not as dense, it's not as thick, and it's often used for glazing. To glaze, G-L-A-Z-E is the infinitive, is to put a very thin layer of something. In fact, a glazer is a person who installs windows. Think about yeah, it. Double glazing, two, double layer, glazing. two layers of glass. So think of a like a window, it's very thin, you can see through it. If you glaze a cake, you'll be using icing rather than frosting. So it's used for decorating, but more glazing than coating. And icing and frosting are equally used for, for cakes. Icing tends to set, that means to become hard and in a fixed position. Whereas frosting uh, tends to, to stay a little bit softer than icing after it has set. Maybe it doesn't set quite as much. It's, it doesn't harden as much. Would you agree with that definition? Yes, I would. And that's why traditionally, if you have a wedding cake, it has icing and not frosting because the icing seals or closes the cake inside or the sponge so that it doesn't become dry. In fact, some people save their wedding cake and they eat it on their 10th or 11th or 50th wedding anniversary and the cake inside is still moist because the icing has stopped the air from getting inside. Yes, and I've just thought about something. I've never tried it, but I imagine that frosting might eventually go off. What but does icing, go off mean? To go off means to become bad when you're talking about food. Because frosting is a bit creamier, a bit thicker, it doesn't become totally hard. I imagine if you kept frosting for about 10 years, it would be inedible. You couldn't eat it, or it certainly wouldn't taste the same. Whereas with icing, it doesn't really matter. As Craig said, you can, and people do, eat an iced cake 10 years later, and it doesn't do them any harm. I'm not sure I would eat 10-year-old frosting, though. No, I agree with that. A word I quite like to say, and say it with me, you might like it too, is ganache. Ganache, G-A-N-A-C-H-E. Ganache is a rich and luxurious chocolate mixture, and I absolutely love it. You make it by combining or mixing chocolate with cream, and it's one of my favorite things. Do you have a sweet tooth, Reza? I do, but not as much as I used to. I thought you were going to say not as much as me. <laughs> and also not as much as you. Let, let's be honest. I think you probably have a sweeter tooth than me. I have all my sweet teeth. <laughs> <laughs> They're all covered all in my, sugar. All my teeth are sweet. <laughs> because, of, because of all the sugar on them all the time. Exactly. So, yeah, I do still appreciate sweet things, but now I pay the price more when I eat them. Uh, you see them gather around my belly, whereas when I was younger, I seemed to be able to burn off the calories more easily than nowadays. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Another favorite of mine is brownie. A brownie is a very dense, which means thick, a very dense, chewy and chocolatey square. 
And if something is chewy, that adjective, you might have heard of the verb to chew. So if you're eating food, you bite it first. And when it's in your mouth, you use your teeth to break it up, to chew it. So if something is chewy, then you keep eating it. It's in your mouth for a long time. And a brownie is dense, chewy, and very, very chocolatey. Yeah, think of chewing gum. The whole point is you have to chew it. You have to keep moving it around. Yeah, you need to use your your mouth a lot to break it up. And I often feel that brownies are not well done. The vast majority of brownies that are sold out and about are not good because they don't have the chewiness that they're supposed to. They're either simply dry with no chewiness or they're just really hard. But for me, as Craig's explained, a proper brownie should be a bit softer in the middle than the outside. Would you agree? Yes, and I think you've tasted my wife's brownies, and that's a good example. It's quite hard on the outside, but it's very, very soft, dense, and chewy inside with a strong chocolate flavor. That's important. Yeah, for me, the stronger, the better. And if you eat a brownie in a restaurant, you might have it served with a scoop of ice cream. That's quite common. A scoop is a big round spoonful. So the verb is to scoop, to collect, to scoop. And a scoop of ice cream next to your brownie or on top of your brownie. If you had a brownie, Reza, what flavor ice cream would you choose? What scoop? That's a good question. Well, Um, I'm pretty much prepared to try any flavor except one. I tell you which flavor I would definitely not use. Chocolate. That's the one I wouldn't. So you don't want, in my opinion, you don't want chocolate ice cream with a chocolate brownie. That's a bad idea. Would you agree? Well, as a chocoholic, (laughs) (laughs) I would happily eat a brownie with a scoop of chocolate ice cream. But I do agree that it's nice to have that mixture, that combination. So maybe vanilla ice cream or a fruit that has a sharp taste like blackberry or strawberry ice cream or you know what's very good there's a salty caramel ice cream that would complement the brownie very well yeah for me as long as it's not chocolate i don't like the idea of the two different chocolate tastes i'd rather have a contrast so anything but chocolate really Well, we don't disagree on many things, but I think we disagree on that. The next one is a cheesecake that you may have heard of, a rich and creamy dessert made with a crust and a filling, which consists of cream cheese, eggs, and sugar. And that word crust, that is a hard outside part. If you think of toast, for example, or a loaf of bread, On the outside of the bread, inside the bread, it's very soft, isn't it? And spongy. But on the outside of the bread, it's often hard. And that is called the crust. So you get a crust on the outside of your rich and creamy cheesecake. And Craig, how do you like your cheesecakes? Do you like them with a crumbly crust? So crumbly means it crumbles. It quite easily falls apart. Do you like a crumbly crust? I do. I do like a crumbly crust on my cheesecake and also a crumbly base underneath the cheesecake. I like cheesecake with a biscuit base that's crumbly. It falls apart. Buildings crumble, don't they? Buildings, if they're very old, they fall apart. And the same thing can happen with pastry. The next one is something which I ate a few days ago. Homemade, may I say. Lemon tart or lemon pie. One of my all-time favorites. That's a a pastry, usually eaten as a dessert, with a very buttery crust. There's a lot of butter in the crust. And it's filled with tangy. Tangy means very sharp or acidic with lots of acid. Like citrus. Citrus fruits are tangy. In this case, it's lemon. But you could say that grapefruit can also be tangy and orange can be tangy but in this case tangy lemon flavored a type of custard custard is what you call in spanish the tea is it's kind of like a custard but lemon based so a custard is like a sweet thick sauce made with milk or eggs or sometimes powder you can have custard powder and you just add milk to it 
I've just remembered, I tell a lie. That means I need to correct myself. I didn't have lemon pie a few days ago. It was specifically lemon meringue pie. Now I remember, which is a slight variation. So the bottom bit, the bottom half is the same, but added on top of that, there is the meringue. So that very light, very fluffy, light, full of air, white substance, which is made out of egg whites. The white part of an egg is called a white. (laughs) No mystery there. And it is beaten. Yeah, you move it a lot. So it becomes very light and fluffy. And very often, if you put that on top of lemon pie, then you've got yourself a lemon meringue pie. That's what I had the other day. Have you ever made custard yourself? I've never made custard, but I did bake recently a Portuguese custard tart. What about that? I saw a picture. They look really, really nice. I didn't actually get to try it, (laughs) strangely, but um, they disappeared quite quickly. But I did see a photo of your (laughs) Portuguese. (laughs) They wouldn't have kept, Craig. No, honestly, it's true. That's two lies you've told in a minute. No, no, it's true. I made them about a week before I came here, and I'm not sure you should really keep them a week. They wouldn't be. No, no, no. It wouldn't be optimal. But yeah, you had to. You had to eat them the same day, otherwise they wouldn't be good. (laughs) Yes, but they're the best on the same day yeah but i was really proud of myself i've been to lisboa to lisbon a couple of times and i love portuguese custard tarts just like my mum, she goes crazy about them and it was her birthday i wasn't with her but she inspired me to make them so she couldn't actually eat one but i sent her a picture which (laughs) isn't quite the same and i said look if you were here mum, i would give you one uh but uh, i'm afraid i'll have to eat it for you didn't she say, how are you going to get them to me? And you said, well, I'm not. I'm going to eat them myself. Yeah, I said, well, you, you can't trust the post, Mom. It's very expensive. <laughs> it would be off by the time you get it. I'll just eat it for you. So, yes, custard, a very important thing for, for Portuguese people. I'm not sure about in Brazil. I know we have quite a lot of of our listeners in Brazil. Do, do you eat them as well in Brazil? I know that the most famous ones are called Paste de Belém. But that's not Belém in Brazil. That's Belém beside uh, Lisboa. But I know you've got a big city in Brazil called Belém as well. Do you eat those? Do you eat custard tarts in Brazil? I'd I'd like to know. Please uh, send us a message and, and let us know if the Brazilians, like the Portuguese, eat custard tarts. Before we continue with this week's podcast, we just want to let you know that you can now improve your English with both of us personally. That's not not at the same time, but we both will help you in different ways to improve your English. With me, you can join one of my conversation courses, and that means you'll be in a small group of lovely students, and together we will have discussions and debates and role plays and lots of different activities that are all designed to help you improve your fluency and your confidence when you're speaking English. And for more information, just send me an email, craig, C-R-A-I-G, at inglespodcast.com. And Reza, you also offer classes online, correct? That's right. But my focus or speciality is more with one-to-one with individuals. So if you'd like a a one-to-one individual class to focus on your particular needs, you could get in touch with me. Just send me an email to belfastreza at gmail.com. And now let's get back to the podcast. So lemon tarts, Reza said, or lemon pie, there's an expression as easy as pie, which is very common in American English. And if something is as easy as pie, it's very, very easy to do. So if you are good at making cakes, you might say, well, for me, baking cakes is as easy as pie. However, in the UK, we're more likely to say a piece of cake. So the same meaning, it's very easy, it's easy to do. Oh, it's nothing. It's a piece of cake. Speaking of cake, our next one is fruitcake. 
I don't think you need to be a genius to work out that it's a cake that has fruit in it. <laughs> so a fruit cake is usually for British or Irish people or English speakers. It's, I think it's the same in America, as far as I know. It's a dense cake filled with candied or dried fruit. So candied fruit or dried fruit is fruit which has had the, the moisture, yeah, the humidity taken out of it. So it reduces in size and that way the taste is more intense. Fruitcake also typically has nuts, things like peanuts, almonds, walnuts, that type of thing. And very often it's spiced as well. It will have spices in it, things like cinnamon and that type of thing, perhaps nutmeg. That's the typical stuff you get inside a fruitcake. But Craig, there is another type of fruitcake, isn't there? Yes, if you want to call somebody a bit eccentric, crazy, unusual, strange, you can say that they are as nutty as a fruitcake. For example, he's as nutty as a fruitcake. He has some very strange habits. So a little bit um, eccentric, unusual, not the normal kind of person, doesn't fit into society, a bit weird. He's as nutty as a fruitcake. Now, Craig, the next word, I'm going to spell it. You say it. S-C-O-N-E. Scone. Ah, I say scone. Yeah, both pronunciations are correct, aren't they? Yeah, the big debate. And it isn't a regional thing. Let me repeat that. It's not an Irish English thing. No, 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 no. I know English people who say scone and I know English people who say scone. I know Irish people who say scone. I know Irish people who say scone. The same for Scottish people. It just seems to be a personal thing, doesn't it? It does, but both are acceptable. And what are they? Well, they are, they resemble or they're similar to a very small and slightly sweet or maybe savoury biscuit, but very thick. So not a thin biscuit, but, but very thick. And scones or scones are often served with tea and cream, sometimes clotted cream. Clotted cream, C-L-O-T-T-E-D, is very thick cream that kind of separates because it's it's been heated. And if you've heard the expression a blood clot, that's a very dangerous thing when there's a pieces in your blood that could kill you. That's the idea with clotted cream, although clotted cream that could, it kills you? could all, <laughs> would it, if you eat too much of it, because it's not good for your arteries, it's not good for your heart, because it does have a lot of cholesterol. But clotted cream, in the same way as a blood clot, there are big pieces in it, and heating the cream causes it to fragment and break apart. And if we're serving cream, whether it's clotted or whipped, and whipped cream is thick cream that has been beaten so that it has air inside, you could use the expression a dollop of whipped cream, D-O-L-L-O-P. So before we had a scoop of ice cream, and now we have a dollop of whipped cream, which is another funny word to say, dollop. Reza, do you like your scones with jam and a dollop of whipped cream? Yes, either whipped cream or clotted cream, depending on how I'm feeling. If there's only jam available, then I will have them with jam. But in that case, they need butter as well. So first butter and then jam, if there's no cream. If there is cream, then I forego the butter. That means I don't have the butter. I'll have the jam with the cream. And I know that your mum makes very good scones because I've actually tasted them. So I can definitely witness the fact that you have, you're in your family. I'm sure you've had lots of very nice scones or scones in your life. That's true. She, she makes them homemade. But Craig, there's one part of the world which is particularly associated with scones for me more than any other. Do you think of any part of the world? I think of Ireland when I think of scones. Oh, yeah. From, they're very, very Irish. But one place where I think about even more for scones is Devon and Cornwall. Well, that's maybe more for the cream, the clotted cream. Right. 
They're, 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 they cream love teas. their... Exactly. Cre- what they call the cream tea in Devon or Cornwall is not tea with cream in it. You might think that. It means a cup of tea, probably with milk, accompanied by a scone, but the scone will have cream on it. That's very, very typical in Devon and Cornwall. And uh, there are two counties in the southwest of England. But they disagree about how you should prepare the scone. In Cornwall, they insist that you apply the jam before the cream. And in Devon, they insist that you apply the cream before the jam. <laughs> it's curious. Sound, it sounds like a, a first world problem. Yeah, <laughs> It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> Be careful of the difference between jam and ham, especially if you're a Spanish speaker. Ham is meat that comes from a pig. And Spanish ham is very good, among the best in the world. And jam, j, is very sweet. And you put it on scones, jam. The next word is a word I bet you know because it's been accepted into Spanish and many other languages. That's the word muffin, M-U-F-F-I-N. As you probably know, it's a small, round, and typically sweet baked bread product. It's kind of like a type of bread, but it often contains fruits and nuts and maybe even chocolate chips. Occasionally, but not so often, you see a muffin with some kind of frosting on top. But I think original muffins don't have frosting. Would you agree with that, Craig? Yeah, typically they they have things inside. A muffin will have things inside. And an interesting question is the difference between a muffin and a cupcake. A cupcake is, think of it as being a cake in a cup or as Reza would say, a bun. So it's a cake in a cup. And they tend to have more sugar. They tend to be a bit sweeter than muffins. And they tend to have frosting on top and maybe some chocolate pieces or coloured sweets on top. So they're decorated. Whereas muffins have fillings like jam or chocolate or nuts or fruit inside. And they're more popular for breakfast. So if you have a a coffee for breakfast and it's it's quite common to see in cafes muffins at breakfast time rather than cupcakes and the way they're made is different too because cupcakes tend to have more air in the sponge so they're a bit lighter and muffins tend to be more dense <laughs> The next one on our list, and I apologise for my really bad French accent, is croissant, which is a buttery, flaky, we've had that word before, and a crescent-shaped pastry. The pastry is in the shape of a crescent, like the piece of a moon, obviously from France, the word croissant, and typically enjoyed at breakfast time. Now, have you ever had a good croissant in Spain, Reza? Yes, but not many, I'll be honest. They're a bit like a mountain lion or a white rhino. You don't often see many good croissants in the wild over here. Yeah, and the thing is, they're incredibly popular. The Spanish eat a lot of croissants and many places uh, sell them. Most of them, though, are not worth eating, in my opinion. No, I agree. (laughs) But you do get the odd place, which is quite good. Strangely, I would say there's more chance of getting a decent croissant in England than in Spain. The problem is, I'm guessing that we've both eaten croissants in France. And after you've eaten a croissant in France, then you really know what the quality should be. And I remember particularly when I first arrived in Spain, we're talking 25 years ago, the vast majority of croissants certainly did not have butter in them. And it's absolutely fundamental for the French that a croissant has butter. But the Spanish 25 years ago quite often used lard or something similar, a Poly- vegetable oil. oil, maybe. And it just doesn't work. It's got to be with butter. So from France to Denmark and a Danish pastry, which is a sweet pastry, often layered, filled with fruit, cheese or nuts and with icing or a glaze on top of it. But where does the name Danish pastry come from? 
Well, you you imagine they come from Denmark originally, but no, <laughs> the Danish that we know and love today originated in Vienna, in Austria. But it was brought to Denmark in the mid-1800s because there was a strike. Uh, that means when people refused to work amongst the bakery workers, and that pushed the Danish bakery owners to hire workers from abroad. So among the, the bakers from abroad they hired were Austrian people and they brought their recipes to Denmark. And that's why they started to, to call this thing in Vienna a Danish, curiously enough. Interesting. Now I'm back to France again where we have the Eclair. And that originated in Lyon in France back in the 19th century. And it's a long thin pastry that's filled with cream and often covered in chocolate icing. Sometimes you get like a vanilla icing on top, but my favourites are covered in chocolate, of course. And what about uh, the filling in the middle? If there's filling in the middle, do you prefer the traditional cream filling or do you like a chocolate filling? Have a guess. Chocolate. Yep. <laughs> See, again, for me, it's, it's too I'm much so chocolate. so predictable. Uh, I like really strong chocolate on top, the icing, but I prefer the traditional cream filling, I have to say. I always think of my mum when I, when I see eclairs because that was her favourite pastry, chocolate eclair. I think earlier Craig mentioned puff pastry. That is um, a light flaky pastry made by repeatedly, time and time again, folding and rolling layers of dough, D-O-U-G-H, dough, the basic material that you make the, the pastry from. Flour and water, isn't it? Flour and water, yeah. that's dough, yeah. And just like Spanish, we use the word dough in English, la masa or la, or la pasta as well. You say la pasta para hornear to mean money. So if I say to you, I've got loads of dough, it's like a Spanish, tengo mucha pasta. And the pasta is what you use to, to bake with in Spain and the dough in English. So puff pastry, you won't be surprised to hear, like many similar things, comes from France. It was invented way back in the 17th century by someone called Claudius Gell or Gell. And he was a pastry cook apprentice so he was just learning and he wanted to improve bread make it better some way for his father who was sick and he was on a diet of only flour and butter and water that's all he could eat so he invented puff pastry for that reason we're staying in europe now on our tour around the world of pastry and cakes and we're going from france to germany and strudel i don't know how you say it in a german accent strudel Strudel. That's a traditional European pastry, and it's made of thin layers of dough. There's that word again, dough. And it's filled with nuts and fruit or sweetened cheese. And strudel comes from the German word strudel, which means whirlpool. And I did not know that. A whirlpool, there's another word in English, which is eddy. And that's when the water swirls and moves in a circle. Did you know that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's continue our journey, but we're going to leave Europe for a minute uh, to talk about baklava. B-A-K-L-A-V-A. -A -A. That's a sweet pastry. It's very sweet. And it's of Middle Eastern origin. And it's made of layers of a thing called phyllo dough, or some people say phyllo pastry. There's two ways to spell it, by the way. You can have a look in the show notes. You can spell it P-H-Y-L-L-O, or you can spell it F-I-L-O, phyllo pastry or phyllo dough. And nuts and an essential ingredient is also honey or possibly syrup. Probably really should be honey, but if you're doing a cheaper version, <laughs> syrup perhaps. Baklava, it's originally from Turkey and Greece and the Middle East, although you can find it in other countries now. But it was brought to Hungary, first of all, uh, by Turkish invaders from the 16th century. That's how it got into European culture. That's quite weird, isn't it, if you think about it? It was brought to Hungary by Turkish invaders. You can imagine the Turkish arriving and saying, we are conquering your country. You will be our slaves. 
but have some baklava, have some cake <laughs> while, while we're here. <laughs> Next, we're going to Italy and cannoli, which is an Italian pastry that originally comes from Sicily. And it's a tube-shaped shell. If you've been to the seaside and you've looked at some shells on the beach, this shape is like a tube and it's filled with ricotta cheese that has been sweetened. So it has a very sweet taste, this ricotta cheese. And if you've seen Godfather 1, the first Godfather film, you may remember a scene in which Peter Clemenza kills somebody in a car, in a car and he says to the person with him, leave the gun, take the cannoli. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, that rings a bell. Actually, there's another scene in Godfather. I think it was Godfather 2 in the opera where one of the old men, I can't remember his name, was killed by a poisoned cannoli by the sister, well, the daughter of the Godfather, Talia Shire, her name is. She was in Rocky. She was Rocky Balboa's wife, and she killed someone with a poisoned cannoli. And whenever I eat a cannoli, I think of that film. Oh, I, I don't remember that scene, but that, that sounds fun. Now, a word I mentioned earlier was cinnamon as a spice that you might find in, for example, fruitcake. Or in the Pasté de Belém, in Portugal, they put a bit of cinnamon on the top. Well, another classic is cinnamon roll. That's a sweet roll made from rolled dough, not surprisingly, filled with cinnamon. Also sugar and butter. And often on top, it is topped with icing. The cinnamon rolls that most of us know today are thought to have originated in Sweden, in Scandinavia. And on the topic of rolls, there's also a jam roll. Or it can also be called a jelly roll. And there's a difference in origin of those two words because in British English, we're more likely to say jam. And in American English, they'd probably say jelly. You may have heard of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in America. Well, we would say in the UK, peanut butter and jam sandwiches. So it's a roll of sponge cake that has jam inside it, and it's often served as a dessert. Some people also call it Swiss roll. I don't know if that's because it's supposed to come from Switzerland. I'm not sure, but I've, I've also heard it referred to a Swiss roll. Have you heard that? I've never seen a Swiss roll, but I've, I've seen a German do a somersault. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Let's move swiftly on. I think we should. Let's go back to Italy. Always a good place to eat. Let's get some tiramisu. I'm sure you've heard of that. It's the same word in Spanish. As you probably know, it's an Italian dessert. But did you know it's made with layers of coffee soaked? That means you leave it in the liquid. You soak it. The The coffee soaked lady fingers. Now, what do we mean by that, Craig? A lady finger? What, we put a lady's finger in it? Well, let's hope not. I mean, that would be cannibalism. What do we mean by this? A, a lady finger? What's that? Isn't it a type of Italian sponge that soaks up the liquid coffee? Yes. And I imagine they call it lady finger because it's long. It's long and thin like a finger. So it's not round. It's long and thin like a finger. A lady's finger. And also mascarpone cheese. And it's dusted... Dust is polvo, right? So when you put just a little bit on top, it's dusted with cocoa powder. Remember, cocoa, C-O-C-O-A, in English, refers to the basic ingredient of chocolate. Don't confuse it with the coconut, yeah? Cocoa, C-O-C-O-A, powder. It originated in Treviso, around about 1800, and it is said that it was invented by a woman who was working in, shall we say, a house of pleasure in the centre of the city. A lady of the night, a prostitute. Interesting. And one thing I learned about tiramisu is the meaning of it, because tiramisu might translate into English as pick me up. If you think about it, it has coffee, which has caffeine and Cocoa, which also gives you energy and it's quite sweet, and the mascarpone cheese. So it's a dessert, one of my favorites actually, that gives you energy. It picks you up. And we might have a cup of tea to pick us up, and the Italians might have a tiramisu. And the next cake we have is called pound 
cake. Pound cake. Now, I'm not talking about money. It doesn't cost a pound. I'm talking about weight because in the UK, they used to measure ingredients with, and maybe still do, by the pound and not by the kilo. I think there's 2.2 kilos in a pound. And why is it called a pound cake? Because it's made with a pound each of butter, sugar, eggs, and flour. So very easy to measure, very easy to make. It's very dense. It's very rich. And it was created in England during the 1700s. Have you ever tasted it? No, this one interested me very much when Craig told me about it. I'd never heard of it before. So this is a good reminder of how cooking and baking is very regional in all countries in the world. I'd never heard of it. And I find it fascinating that it was made with these ingredients, a pound each of each one. So it reminded me of something which I thought I'd put in the notes, which perhaps Craig has never heard of. Have you ever heard of 15s? No, I haven't, apart from the fact that 15 is a number. But no, that's new to me. So what is it? So I've learned about an English cake from Craig, and I'm going to tell him about a Northern Irish, classic Northern Irish, tray bake. A tray bake is like a kind of a, a cake, but you make it on a tray. And some tray bakes don't even require any cooking, in fact. So 15s is very, very common in Northern Ireland. And that's why I have a soft spot for it, because I come from there. But most people in England, Scotland, Wales have never heard of it. But you'll see it all over Belfast. Why 15s? It's got... 15 digestive biscuits, 15 marshmallows, and 15 glacé cherries. Also a little bit of condensed milk and a sprinkling, just a little bit on top, of desiccated coconut. That's why we call it 15s. So very low on calories. Oh yeah, very low. <laughs> very good if you're on a diet. <laughs> it has a lot more than 15 calories, that much we can say for sure. So I've learned about a new cake from Craig and he's learned about a new tray bake from me. Yeah, that sounds very nice. I'd like to try that one. Our last cake on the list is another personal favourite of mine, the Black Forest Gatto. So we're going back to Germany now, and it's a German dessert which consists of layers. We had that word before, layers, one sheet or, or one spread on top of another of chocolate sponge cake, cherries and whipped cream. Remember, to whip is to add air by beating. So we've got that cream really thick with lots of air inside. And Black Forest Gatto originally comes from a region in southwestern Germany called the Black Forest. And it borders the Alsace region of France. And back in 1915, there was a pastry chef named Joseph Keller. And he is said to have made the first Black Forest cake in his tea room in Bad Godesburg. So that's the history of the Black Forest Gatto. Well, that's it. That was a piece of cake, wasn't it, Craig? Yeah, I was recording this episode for me was a piece of cake. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and that's made me really, really hungry. So now it's your turn, listeners. We want you to practice your English. What's your favourite treat? Is there any cake or pastry you really like? Or do you lean more towards sweet or savoury? So savoury means not sweet. What's your cup of tea? What do you prefer? Send us a, a voice message. Have a look at the link in the show notes to speakpipe.com slash English podcast. Or you could send us an email with a comment or question to me, Craig, at inglespodcast.com or to Reza at belfastreza at gmail. Dot com, especially if you're interested in studying with us, as we mentioned earlier. This podcast is sponsored in part by mansioninglaise.com. Why not visit the online store? Go to store, S-T-O-R-E dot mansioninglaise.net and there you'll find a selection of courses that you can buy and use to improve your English. As usual, we'd like to say thanks very much to our Patreon sponsors, Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. The sponsors of the Patreon program, they donate money. 
Uh, it can be as little as $1.50 per month. And as a way of saying thank you to them for their donation, we give them instant access to transcriptions of this podcast so they get to see every word that we say. If you're interested, uh, follow the link in the show notes to patreon.com slash podcast. And we're not going to mention everybody who's supporting us on Patreon. We simply don't have time. But we do want to say thank you and welcome to our latest Patreon supporters who have joined us recently. And they are Esteban Sanchez, Maria Jose Cuenca Bonilla, Carl Copu, and Pablo Albert. Thank you to you and to everybody who's supporting us on Patreon. Craig, what will we be talking about in next week's episode? I have no idea. So if you can think of a topic for future podcasts, please let Reza and I know and we'll be happy to speak about whatever you need to practice and improve your English. But there will be an episode next week. So until then, we'll say goodbye. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful week. And it's goodbye from me. And bye-bye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. See you later.